Okay, so it's my pleasure to continue this session on uh, Hadron Collider physics. Um, we have the uh, honor of having Marcus Zerlaus here to talk about the HL-LHC upgrade project. Please go ahead, Marcus. All right, thanks a lot. I hope you can hear me well. So many thanks for the invitation. Many thanks for the opportunity to uh, present you a bit where we are with the high luminosity upgrade project. I've seen you already had an exciting first part of the morning uh, and afternoon of discussions, and I'm uh, looking forward to show you a bit on where we are with the realization of this uh, important project at CERN. Uh, and of course, I do that on behalf of many, many colleagues at CERN that are working on that, but also uh, worldwide in, in a lot of different laboratories. So what I have prepared for you today is the following. So of course, when we talk a little bit about the high luminosity upgrade goals, I want to recall as well on what were actually the design goals of the Large Hadron Collider and where, what do we want to achieve with the upgrade that we're preparing and installing soon. Then I'm sure you're keen to hear a little bit about the where we are with the technical deliverables. There is quite a lot of new uh, technologies that we have been preparing for the high luminosity upgrade. I don't have the time today to talk about all of them, but I picked out the four probably most relevant ones. So one of them is, is civil engineering that we had to do to accommodate all the new infrastructure. I have a point on, of course, new niobium three, uh, three tin magnets that are being prepared and installed. I will talk about magnesium deborite supermagnetic links and also crab cavities, which is one of the uh, quite revolutionary technologies prepared and uh, designed for the high luminosity upgrade. And then before concluding, I'm giving you a bit an idea of what we had in mind in terms of project planning and performance ramp up. I will also recall that high luminosity, although it is going to be installed, of course, uh, at CERN, is really a truly international project. Now, uh, as said, just one slide to recall a bit the, the LHC performance goals. I think most of you are, are very well aware of these. Of course, we have the three uh, key design parameters of every circular collider, which is collision energy, instantaneous luminosity, and uh, integrated luminosity. As you all know, the LHC was uh, at least uh, to a large extent built as well for the Higgs discovery that at the time was uh, expected to be at the center of mass energy in the Terra electron volt range. So this is why the decision for the LHC was taken to build a collider with 7 TV uh, center of mass energy. Instantaneous luminosity, of course, to detect rare events like the Higgs, you need a, a quite high instantaneous luminosity. So the design parameter at the time for the LHC was 10 to the 34. And in terms of integrated luminosity, so the number of, of events that uh, get collected over the lifetime of the LHC, which was intended to be 10 to 12 years, was 300 inverse femtobahn. Now, of course, this very last one does not only depend on the design parameters, this also starts depending very much on how well you master and operate your machine, on beam lifetime, the LHC cycle, and also, of course, the overall uh, accelerator efficiency. Now, how have we been doing so far uh, with the LHC? And I think most of you are aware that we have two complete LHC runs already behind us. The first one that was still conducted at a reduced energy of initially three and a half, and then in the last year, four TV. The complete second operational run uh, was done at six and a half TV. And the third operational run that we just have started uh, at the beginning of this year is now being performed at the collision energy of 6.8 TV. So this is maybe the only design parameter that was not yet reached for the LHC. Uh, on the contrary, in terms of instantaneous luminosity, we have been doing very, very well, improving on other parameters of the, uh, of the accelerator and actually exceeding already by a factor of two, the uh, instantaneous luminosity. And this one also has been key to really be on a very good track already in terms of integrated luminosity, even though we have almost a complete uh, operational run still ahead of us. We already have accumulated um, more than 220 inverse femtobahn, so we're very well within reach of the target of 300. Now, here you see a bit the recap of these first two operational runs uh, in just one slide. So you recognize uh, run one, which, is, which took place in the period from 2020 to 2012, and then the second operational run from 2015 to 2018. And you see that uh, maybe at the exception of the two commissioning years, which were 2010 and 15, where you still have to recommission all your system, ramp up the performance. We had very, very stable uh, physics production uh, runs reaching. And of course, the most performant one being the last one in run two, 2018, 
where we managed to accumulate uh, 70 inverse femtobound alone. So all of that brings us that today we have accumulated more than 160 inverse femtobound at 13 TeV and something like 30 inverse femtobound more at lower energies. Uh, this year, uh, we have already collected 26 inverse femtobound at 13.6 TeV. And the machine is really, really running well. We have uh, easily 70 inverse femtobounds per year at hand, if not more. Peak luminosities today are close to 2 to 10 to the 34, as I mentioned before. And we actually managed to have in a single physics fill, which typically takes eight to, uh, eight to 10 hours, more than one inverse femtobound per day. So our expectations today, in particular with the new uh, run three schedule that I will show you in a minute, uh, tells us that probably even at the end of the LHC exploitation period in 2025, we will have accumulated well above 400 inverse femtobound. Now, what are actually in perspective to that, the, the goals of the high luminosity upgrade project. So this is of course to determine and build a hardware configuration and a set of beam parameters that would allow the LHC to reach uh, a number of targets. The first one of course is seeming to be a benign one, but we also have to keep in mind that the LHC today is already 20 years old, so we also have to prepare the entire machine for an operation uh, well all the way up to 2040 and to extend its lifetime, which also means that quite some consolidation activities all around the machine have to be done. And of course, we have to devise beam parameters and an operational scenario to enable our goals. And they are, uh, in essence, a total integrated luminosity of 3,000 inverse femtobound, so a tenfold increase uh, compared to the lifetime of the LHC. This will imply that we accumulate not 70, but um, more than 250 inverse femtobound per year. This, of course, is also a challenge for uh, the high luminosity experiments, but I think you will hear much more about that in the talk uh, just after mine. So they have to be able to digest peak luminosities uh, in the order of 5 times 10 to the 34, if not more. So actually the high luminosity upgrade would be able to achieve higher peak luminosities than that. But of course, the rate of simultaneous in, uh, events in a detector is also a challenge. So actually, we decided very early on to operate with level luminosity. So we will not go further than these 5 times 10 to the uh, 34. And of course, uh, the main number to be kept in mind, an order of magnitude beyond the reach that the LHC was providing to us in the first 10 years of operation. Now, this is uh, in a graphical view what I uh, more or less tried to explain in, in the past slide. So you see here a bit the timeline of the LHC. The very first year of operation is missing here, but you see uh, round one being done between 2010 and 2012, as I, managed, as I mentioned before, at slightly lower uh, collision energy still. Then we went into the first long shutdown, which took two years. We consolidated all the magnet system that then enabled us to uh, increase quite considerably the collision energy to 13 TeV. We had almost four full operational years with a steady increase of the, of the luminosity output of the machine. And that one was then followed by the long shutdown two, which is already partially linked to high luminosity because we have gone through quite a, a massive upgrade of the injector complex of the LHC, which is also needed in order to provide the higher brightness beams that we will then be using as of the beginning of the uh, HLLC exploitation period. Today, we're just here. We're just at the end of 2022, which was the first operational year of the third run of the LHC. And you see that we still have three full years of operation ahead of us before we will then really start the high luminosity period with the long shot on three that will be three years long. And there all the installation that I will show you in a minute will happen on the machine side, but also all the upgrades, of course, of the experiments. This is Atlas and CMS uh, primarily, but also Alice and LHCB will do uh, quite an extensive upgrade program. And then after that, the high luminosity exploitation period is expected to start in the beginning of 2029. And we will then see uh, the mention increase of uh, performance of the machine. So a couple of key dates to be kept in mind. Indeed, physics production really started uh, only in the mid of 2022. This is also why we haven't accumulated so much luminosity, uh, integrated luminosity yet. The beam energy was indeed fixed to 6.8 TeV. So this is still a little bit short of the nominal 7 TeV. And this has to do with um, uh, a somewhat limited training of the main dipole magnets that we have currently installed in the machine. 
Uh, I would also like to draw your attention. There is going to be what we call a longer end of year technical stop, just one year ahead of the long shutdown three. And this one will already be used to start preparing some of the upgrades of the experiments and the machine ahead of the start of LS3. And some of you might also still have in mind that LS3 at the beginning of this year was still intended to be started in 2025. Ever since, because of some delays in, on the project and also the experiment side, the start of LS3 and the high loom exploitation period was shifted by one year and extended to a duration of three years. So let's have a look at the key technologies that actually make the high luminosity upgrade. So indeed, the high luminosity upgrade brings many, many technical challenges and novelties into uh, circular colliders that, were, that did not exist like that in the past. Of course, the upgrades in our case will really be focused around the high luminosity experiments uh, in point one and point five. So this is Atlas and CMS. And you see here in, on this slide already some images of the key uh, upgrades that have to be done. Of course, there is many, many more, but for the sake of time, uh, I don't have the time to go into all the details. So what I would like to show in the following slides is a bit the civil engineering activities that had to take place in order to make room for all the new equipment that has to be housed for the high luminosity upgrade. So this you see here in red. I will explain you a little bit where we are with the preparation of the new and much more powerful large aperture niobium-3 tin magnets that make up our new uh, inner triplet magnets. I will talk about flexible superconducting links uh, as well as about crab cavities, which is also a very novel technology being for a first time deployed in a circular uh, accelerator. So let's have a look first, sorry to, to jump back. So let's zoom in a bit on this, this left-hand side of one of the, uh, one of the new uh, high luminosity experimental uh, insertions. So this is really going to be the focus of the high luminosity upgrade. So in order to provide this um, much more bright, much smaller and more intense beams in the center of the uh, experiments, we have to upgrade primarily all of this uh, uh, straight part of the tunnel, which, which we call the long straight section. So there has to be a complete new uh, magnet system being installed in the triplet region, but also in the matching section a little bit outside. And of course, in order to house uh, all of the new infrastructure and powering and protection equipment that these systems will need, it was decided very early on that uh, we have to excavate new underground galleries. So you see here actually in light gray, the existing LHC and actually former lab tunnel as it existed since, um, since uh, a long time. And here on the right, you see the experimental cavern that could be Atlas or CMS. So there is slight differences, but um, they are actually minor. And what you see here in this light blue or, or a bit darker gray uh, color is actually all the civil engineering, all the new excavations that had to be done to make room for all the infrastructure in terms of cryogenic, cooling and ventilation, uh, power converters, protection equipment that are going to be installed all along these new underground areas and that will connect to the new equipment that is going to be installed in the LHC tunnel via these galleries and these what we call um, uh, vertical cores that will then come really from the top onto the LHC tunnel and provide access for cabling, uh, RF power and the superconducting links. Okay, so this, uh, this of course extends also symmetrically uh, on the other side. And this is one of the uh, works that has really progressed very, very well actually by the end of this year. All of the civil engineering work is going to be completed, and that also has a practical reason, because of course you can imagine that heavy excavation very close to the beam line uh, could have a potential impact due to vibration on uh, the collisions in the experiment. So all of these major civil engineering work was done during LS2. And now we're just really finalizing the work. And one of the novelties that this new underground areas will bring as well is that for a first time, a part of the machine and equipment will actually remain accessible during beam operation. So this before was not possible because powering equipment was installed very close to, to the machine and in some other smaller underground areas here. So this will really for a first time, first of all, provide protection from um, uh, radiation that inevitably will be created from the collisions in the experiments. Plus it will, it will allow continuous access for experts for the maintenance of equipment. 
So I said progress with this is going really, really good. So here you see a, a schematic sketch of the different buildings and underground areas that have to be created. So you see here on the left hand side, the underground part with the big cavern, a lot of metallic platforms that have to be installed to house uh, cryogenic compressors and distribution, cooling and ventilation, the access shaft going to the surface and then on top on the surface, of course, a series of surface buildings which are needed for again cryogenic compressors, cooling and ventilation and electricity. So here a couple of pictures, you see that progress is, is really going well. So we are actually, all the buildings are up and finished. We're just about to finish green spaces and access roads. So this is really in, in the last steps of completion. And if you look inside the buildings, you see that they are basically done. You actually see the first installation of infrastructure, cooling and ventilation, uh, cooling water installations, and so on. So all of that is really, really progressing well. And all of this, despite falling mostly into a rather difficult COVID period in terms of work conditions. Also in point five, the layout is a little bit different, but on top of CMS, you also see that the cryogenic building, cooling and ventilation, electricity building are in the last steps of completion. And having a last look underground, so what I before showed you on the sketch, you also see that this exists really already in reality. So you have here uh, the access shaft with uh, here on top, you actually see already the concrete structures for the, for the lift going down. Uh, then you see all the metallic platforms that are being prepared uh, underground to house the new equipment. This is the long 350 meter long gallery that is running all along parallel to the tunnel um, in point one and five. And of course, you see the happy technical teams upon completion of the work and also our uh, DG Fabiola along with the council members visiting and taking stock of the newly delivered buildings. So all of that is going really, really well. Now, of course, now that the civil engineering uh, is being done, now we have to start filling it. And as I mentioned to you before, a major part of the upgrade will consist in installing much more powerful large aperture uh, magnets in the triplet region. Now, how this looks like you see in this following slide. So you see here a comparison of how this uh, inner triplet region that actually provides the final focusing of the beams towards the experiments of Atlas CMS will look like. You see that for the LHC, of course, optics-wise, it doesn't really change. So we still have three main quadrupoles poles and then the first uh, separation recombination dipole, which in the case of the LHC is still a series of normal conducting magnets. In the high lumi layout, you see that optically it looks similar, but you see that first of all, magnets are much larger, which already hints that they're also much more powerful. And this is actually needed because the aperture has to be much bigger in order to start squeezing the beams towards the experiments. And uh, an additional, maybe not a complication, but a challenge is of course that all of these magnets are, or most of these magnets are produced through international collaboration. So they're not all done at CERN. It's actually only the, the long main quadrupoles which are being built at CERN. All the other ones come from the US, Spain, Italy, uh, and uh, a lot of other international contributions that I will show you a little bit more in the following slides. Now, how do we actually go to these more powerful magnets that we indeed need for the high luminosity LHC? So this also is one of the technical novelties that we had to introduce with the high luminosity project, because the current workhorse that used to be niobium tie for superconducting magnets, and actually all the LHC superconducting magnets are built with this technology, is not sufficient anymore to actually accommodate the higher magnetic fields that we need for our new magnets. So actually we are looking uh, at a region of reaching uh, 12 to 15 Tesla in terms of magnetic field. And you see quite easily that the critical current density of niobium tie as, as a conductor is not sufficient in these regions of fields anymore. So basically you have uh, two fields that you can explore or two technologies that today we have at hand, one of them being niobium-3 tin. And this is also the, the choice that in the end we have been converging upon for the high luminosity LHC magnets. So there you see that uh, you can reach similar critical current densities for the peak fields which are needed than for niobium tie. The other option would have been to go to uh, high temperature superconductors, but this is a technology where still a lot of R&D is ongoing, where we today feel not yet quite ready to actually build uh, accelerator magnets out of that. While for niobium-3 tin, this is perfectly within the reach in terms of magnetic field. It's 
almost a commodity because big quantities of that are already used in MRI. ITER is, is uh, building magnets with more than 500 tons of this material. Still, it comes at a much higher cost than Niobe on Thai. And actually, what we see now during uh, series production, it's, it's a very brittle material that is uh, challenging to handle compared to Niobe on Thai, which has been much more forgiving. And as I said, of course, HTS will certainly uh, be there to pave the way towards even higher fields. But uh, ITCO and other technologies today are not yet ready uh, in applications for accelerators. Now, where we are with these uh, magnets, so for all of them, we are actually already doing pre-series and series production. And here you have just one example. I apologize if it's, if it's barely visible, but here you see one of the seven meter long uh, CERN magnets being on the test bench. And here on the plot on the right, you see that this is a magnet that has performed uh, really, really well. Within a single quench, we managed to bring it up to nominal current of 16.5 kiloamps. And you also see that this performance through uh, two thermal cycles have been perfectly repeatable. So this is uh, really, really good news uh, towards the series production of these magnets. Also at our partner lab, so this is examples from our AUP partners in the US. So they are building the somewhat shorter uh, Q1 magnets. Actually there we have two four meter long objects which are going to be assembled into a single cold mass. You see here how the last steps are being done to actually weld the, the cold mass and prepare it for the first uh, horizontal test that we're expecting at the end of this month. So here you see we also still build traditional magnets. So traditional means now you'll be on tie based. Here you see an example of the uh, separation uh, recombination dipole D1. So this is a very long magnet, as you can see. It's built by our uh, Japanese collaborators. And here you see just before the insertion into the vertical test stand. And actually this first prototype magnet will soon be on its way uh, to CERN for the installation in, in one of our test benches. Uh, similar collaborations ongoing as well for the D2. Again, an Iobion tie magnet, very long being connected at the end with uh, a counted cosine theta corrector magnet that comes from China actually. And you see this magnet also already on one of the horizontal test benches at CERN being prepared and uh, magnetic measurements being performed. Correctors are also very challenging objects in the era of high luminosity LHC because while correctors were still operating with uh, 100 or 200 amps of current in the LHC era, now we need to uh, go almost 10 times higher than that. So we have nested orbit correctors that are operated with almost two kiloamps of current. We are also uh, employing quite novel magnetic designs using uh, design ideas like counted cosine theta that is, is very ingenious because it solves a lot of the uh, problems of prior uh, magnet construction because the conductor is just put into grooves of a former and all the magnetic field is actually determined by the machining of this, this former. Also a lot of higher order correctors that we need for the high luminosity LHC. Uh, you don't see it really from the outside when these uh, higher over characters are being put and assembled together. But if you actually look through the beam pipe, you can clearly distinguish the different magnetic poles of the different magnets, reaching all the way from a dodeca pole, so 12 magnetic poles, to a skew uh, quadruple pole at the very end. Okay, so now that we have the magnet system actually installed and put in a tunnel, we, of course, have to now deal with the complexity that uh, the power converters and the powering equipment is, is much further away than it used to be in the past. And we have solved this by employing uh, new superconducting links. So they are new. We already have superconducting links in the LHC today, but they're also based on iobium tie cables. This time, for the first time, we went to magnesium deborite. So it's an, it's an HTS conductor. And you see the cross section of the cable that has been produced for that here. So it holds actually many seven kiloamp, 18 kiloamp conductors, which are bundled together in a cable of, of roughly 90 millimeters of diameter that can transport more than 100 kiloamps uh, at 25 Kelvin. And the first demonstrator of that was already uh, done two years ago in, in one of CERN's test facility. It's a little bit hard to see at the end, but here you see the, the flexible cryostat going off. Today, we're already halfway through the series production of these cables. So you see here behind uh, the long cable that is going to be used to power the inner triplet magnets and one for the matching section magnets. And here in the front, you see a little bit better on how this flexible cryostat is going to look like. 
Um, so it's really a kind of a Roman structure that is also needed in order to do all of these uh, difficult descent from the new underground areas into the LHC tunnel. So, of course, there is a lot of industrial procurement involved. The flexible cryostat, for example, comes from industry. And here you see um, a leak testing of one of these flexible cryostats before they're then being spooled on these quite massive rolls and being transported to CERN for final testing and integration. OK, so last but not least, I, I quickly want also to say something about uh, crab cavities. So if you think about cavities, of course, you inevitably think about accelerating cavities. But this is actually not the case with the crab cavities. I will not go very much into a, a physical explanation, but these are basically used to compensate for uh, the detrimental effect of the crossing angle when you actually bring these punches into collision in the experiments and the further you actually uh, squeeze the beams, the bigger you have to make the crossing angle and the, the smaller actually gets the overlap of these punches. So crab cavities is quite an ingenious idea to actually give a certain transversal kick to the head and the tail of the bunches that would tilt the bunches a little bit that compensates for this uh, geometric factor uh, that you lose uh, in the collision point of the experiment. So this, of course, can have a significant beneficial impact to claw back some of this luminosity loss that you otherwise lose. But of course, it's, it means the complexity of being able to create uh, an oscillating transverse electric field that kicks the head and the tail of the bunches in opposite direction. And of course, once you have gone through the experiment, you have to do uh, the inverse uh, effect on the other side. And all of that has to be done in quite uh, challenging space constraints. But all of that has been achieved. And I'm just going to show you two designs that in the end have been retained after a quite major R&D program. So these are called uh, the RF dipole and the double quarter wave. So they have very particular shapes. And we also need two different types because of the different crossing angles that we have uh, or crossing plane that we have between Atlas and CMS. One of them is horizontal. The other one is vertical. And of course, while these are early prototypes today, we're much further. Actually, here you see pictures of uh, where two of these RF dipoles are already fully integrated um, in the clean room by our UK partners. Uh, before they're actually going into the vacuum chamber and the cryogenic module that then will be sent to CERN uh, next year for being tested in the SPS. And I would just like to highlight that crab cavities is really uh, a completely novel concept. This has never been used or even demonstrated in Hadron Colliders. And uh, I would just like to highlight that one of our engineers, uh, Rama Kalaga, that has been following that very closely, has already or recently received as well the uh, use bus prices for all of this work to actually bring the crab cavity design from concept into a real application in the, uh, in the high luminosity period. Okay, just to conclude very quickly and remembering that high luminosity is indeed a truly international and a worldwide collaboration. High luminosity designs have already started with uh, quite extensive R&D programs in the US and CERN under EU governance uh, back in the 2000s. The project was then approved uh, around 2010. And ever since, we really see many, many more international coll collaborations coming up, without whom actually the realization of the project would not have been possible. And if you look back uh, at the installation of the different magnets and elements that I have been mentioning before, you see that this is quite a challenging integration of equipment that comes from different parts from the US, Europe, uh, Asia, uh, and all over the world. And this, of course, also then continues uh, from the inner triplet region towards the, the long arcs. OK, so I'm almost at the end. Just to finish a bit on where we are with the current project planning. So I take back again the slide that I showed you in the very beginning. So I mentioned before that we're now at the end of 2022. So series production of all of the equipment I have been showing you uh, has started and is actually ongoing in full swing. So we still have three years ahead of us to complete all of that. In the beginning of 2026, the long shutdown three of the LHC will start. So the machine will be stopped. First, uh, all the existing long straight sections will be deinstalled and that, that will be followed by more or less two years of installation work before the commissioning of the high luminosity equipment will start in the second half of 28 to be ready to restart with beam in the high luminosity area uh, as of 2029. And then of course, we all expect to see uh, the um, 
promised uh, performance upgrade that I mentioned in the very beginning. So what does that mean in terms of expected performance? So I mentioned in the very beginning that uh, we expect the LHC to stop uh, well beyond the 400 inverse femtobahn. And then you see in the first and in the second operational exploitation period of high luminosity LHC, we will see uh, a steady increase of the performance reaching already 1200 inverse femtobahn in the first three years of operation and then uh, approaching the target of the 3000 inverse femtobahn, which are intended for the high luminosity exploitation. And with this, I'm at the end. I hope I have covered most of the uh, key technologies of the high luminosity LHC. And in case you're interested in more details, I allow myself to put you two more references to the technical design reports that hold everything that I said in much more detail. And with that, thanks a lot for your attention. And I'm there for question if there are any. Great, thank you. Thank the speaker. Okay, questions for Marcus. The question is about the civil engineering challenge that you mentioned at the beginning. Yes. So how did you uh, do this while the run was going on? And what was the care that needed to be taken? Because these well, alignments of the beams are very precise and so on and so forth. Exactly. So, so as I mentioned before, so indeed there were a lot of studies and simulations being done. So we have really tried uh to geologically understand first of all what is the composition of our of our ground to see what is the propagation of vibrations that in particular would uh, would arise when we start doing the major excavation now as i mentioned before we have seen very early on that this likely is going to be a problem so most of the uh, excavation has actually been done during the long shutdown too when the machines were not operating and uh, still a part of the first vertical shaft was indeed being digged while the run two was still ongoing. But there we actually have been using digging techniques that would uh, create less vibration on the soil. But indeed, it's, it's been demonstrated that excavation work indeed is measurable on the luminosity in the experiments. So in the end, how it was solved was mainly by time decoupling. So in the end, it's clear as soon as you start doing excavation very close to uh, the collision point, this would not work. Okay, thank you. And lucky you didn't find water. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, the question is regarding this MGV2 superconducting link. So these are the new in the LHC upgrade. So earlier, which links we were using to power the magnets? Well, before indeed we had already superconducting links, I, I think I mentioned it. So indeed they were basically done with niobium tie cables. So we also had uh, indeed niobium tie uh, cables that were installed, not in flexible links like you see here. They were actually solid links and they were comparably short, sometimes 20, 30 meters long, I think. Uh, and we have one very long one that is indeed 300 meters, but it carries only currents of 600 amps, nothing comparable uh, to these ones. So it's basically just niobium tie cable extensions of the magnets. While this time we really have niobium three tin magnets and magnesium diboride superconducting links within okay. the same electrical circuit. Okay, so these are uh, HTS links. So earlier it might be niobium tie and the warm portion as copper itself. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that uh, all the hardware activity which will improve the luminosity. Uh, but after 2035, there's another step of the luminosity increase. How will you achieve that? Any change in hardware or running option you will change? No, normally after the end of LS3, there is no major hardware uh, change expected anymore. So I think what we will see afterwards is just with more and more experience and operational knowledge of your machine, we will be able to uh, optimize beam parameters, optimize beta star, optimize optics configurations in order to, uh, to maybe squeeze out even a bit more of instantaneous luminosity from the machine. And this is actually quite a natural progression that we also have seen in the LHC, that in the very early years, we didn't really see the expected nominal performance. This, this also comes with your increasing understanding of how to operate actually the machine. Okay, thanks. Oh, hi, Marcus, this is Shopon Chattopadhyay. I want to thank you especially for, for coming in the last minute because we were having a hard time getting somebody and with Frank's help, you agreed to do this at very short notice. 
Thank you very much. I'll send you a special note later, okay? Many thanks. thanks. It's a Thank pleasure. You. And maybe in the future, I will even yeah, be yeah, able Yeah, I, to I know you first. want to come to India and we'll, and we'll make sure you do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you.